be that some future generation is going to look back at us and say, why did they destroy the, a whole generation of people? Why did they do that? And Jonathan talked about uh, rape and incest and children that are conceived in, in those uh, vile actions. But, uh, you know, I'm just an old country boy. <laughs> I tell you what, to stop that, if the uh, death penalty were imposed for those actions, you'd see, see it cut down quite a bit. And uh, as vile a crime as that is, you know, it is, uh, many of us have suffered uh, injuries and what have you that have been, uh, we've had to deal with that ongoing, but that's, that's just the nature of being human. So those uh, who may conceive cause of rape or incest, the action itself is bad, but there's still a child there. It's still a child. And as bad as it may be for the uh, prospect of mother, mother, a lot of things like that happen in life. Like I say, injuries that you have to deal with. But you just go on. You just deal with it and go on. So anyway, that's not the, my topic tonight, so... Good job, Jonathan. So turn over to Nahum. And we left off chapter 2, verses 11 last time. And uh, as we said about uh, Nahum, it is solely talking about the destruction of Nineveh. And I've always said that these prophets always offer hope uh, in, in, as well as judgment, always offer both. But you're not going to find an offer of hope in Nahum for Nineveh. That's already been done in Jonah. Jonah preached to them and they repented. But something happened. They fell back into uh, idolatry and what have you and, and uh, disobedience and unrighteousness. and So... Even though the Lord may offer opportunity for repentance, at some point in time, there's going to be judgment. And it will not be avoided. And the time for repentance is over. Judgment is going to come. And when we get over to, to Habakkuk, uh, which is uh, immediately following, we'll see um, the uh, fact that the righteous sometimes, a lot of times, suffer with the unrighteous. But that's just the nature of uh, judgment. But anyway, here in verse 11, it says, Where is the dwelling of the, the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? And uh, it's talking about uh, Nineveh. It's uh, describing them as lions. And Nineveh is a place where they... The young lions feed. And, uh, the lion walks, the lioness, and the lion's cub. you got four generations of uh, lions here. The mature lion, the, the young lion, the, the lioness, and the, and the cub. And no one made them afraid. <clears throat> and Nineveh, Nineveh was not fearful of anyone. They, they were the top dog in the world at that time. They feared no one. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs. So Nineveh, when talking about tearing in pieces, talking about the nations around him, he took for them all the things that were necessary for his own people. He killed for the lionesses, filled his caves with prey. Not only did he kill, but he uh, filled up his caves <clears throat> and his dens with uh, flesh. Now, if you... Uh, I don't remember if it's King James or ASV that they have the word there, raven, or A V I N. That just means torn flesh. Flesh has been torn. 
In 13, he says, uh, Behold, I am against you. He's against uh, Nineveh. It says the Lord of hosts, I will burn your chariots in smoke. Remember, chariots were uh, a symbol of military power. And the sword shall devour your young lions. So uh, rather than them just uh, changing their ways, there's going to be another force that's going to come with the sword. Uh, you know, again, a, a military uh, effort is going to be exerted against them, and it's going to devour their lions, their young lions. And the, the prey that they uh, used to feed upon is going to be gone. They're not going to have access. And the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. The messengers but just those that were sent out to proclaim the uh, edicts of Nineveh uh, to the other nations. And they're not going to be there anymore. They're going to be gone. And in verse uh, chapter 3, it says, Woe to the uh, bloody city. And it is full of lies and robbery. If you have, have the ASV, it says raping. Uh, again, that just means uh, stealing or robbery or what have you. Its victim never de departs. The noise of a whip, the noise of a, uh, rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of cl clattering chariots. Now, you think of uh, the assault upon Nineveh, what it was like just in your kind of close your eyes or, or maybe you have to keep your eyes open so you can read. But just imagine what... Uh, being done here, the uh, the battle that's taken place. Horsemen charged with bright sword and a glittering spear. So the sun is shining off of these instruments. There's a multitude of slain. It's going to be a lot of people that are dying in this uh, overthrow of Nineveh. A great number of bodies, countless corpses. There's going to be so many of them that the invading army is going to have to jump over these bodies because of the multitude of, of uh, harlotries this is the reason this is going to happen because of the multitude of harlotries of Nineveh of the seductive harlot uh, and a seductive harlot Nineveh is one that when they conquered these other lands they may have Entice them with various and sundry uh, promises or, or or what have you, but they never honored them. <laughs> they uh, seduced them and they just actually, you know, conquered conquered them and subjected them to their rule. The mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries, again her her idolatries, her spiritual unfaithfulness, if you will. And families through her, her sorceries, her, her uh, magic tricks, and what have you. Said, Behold, I am against you. Well, where Nineveh had to contend with uh, other nations and what have you, now Nineveh has to contend with God Himself. So the, Nineveh is not going to be able to entice God or seduce God or anything like that. He said, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. And you have to kind of imagine, uh, let's just say, woman lifting the skirts. That's a shameful uh, act. And it uh, shows great contempt for whoever, whoever you do it to. <clears throat> and I will show the nations your nakedness. Nineveh is going to be stripped bare, and uh, the nations are going to be able to see Nineveh for what it, for what it really is. Uh, they're going to be uh, shamed and in great contempt. It says in the kingdoms, I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your uh, shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you. Now, you think of anything that uh, causes someone to be covered in filth. 
It's an abomination. But then then was going to be covered in filth. Uh, it may be symbolic filth, but again, they're going to be uh, in filth. It's going to make you vile. People are going to despise you. And it's going to make you a, a spectacle. They're going to look at you and say, mm, this is really bad. It's going to be great uh, disdain. So uh, uh, when all this takes place, the, the grandeur that Nineveh is going to be gone. It's not going to exist anymore. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you. They're going to try to get away from you. You're going to be so, uh, Nineveh is going to be so vile and, and filthy, and people are going to do the best they can to get away from them. And they'll say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? The attitude of the uh, nations around about uh, when uh, Nineveh falls is good riddance. <laughs> we're, we're glad to be rid of you. Nobody's going to lament the fact that Nineveh has fallen. Are you better than no Ammon? And Ammon is the uh, same as Thebes. And in, in, uh, see, I have to think of how the uh, it's south of of Cairo, about 450 miles south of Cairo. But it's uh, it's Thebes, and uh, uh, so it's the city of Ammon. Uh, Ammon was one of the gods of uh, of Egypt. And they were destroyed by uh, Asher Banipal. He's one of the uh, last or first uh, rulers of uh, of uh, Babylon. So it, No Ammon was destroyed by Asher Banipal. He says that was situated by the river. It may be more than one river, but it's the Nile and the tributaries that had waters around her whose rampart was like the sea and whose wall was like the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. And Ethiopia, of course, south of Egypt, and they were kind of considered uh, one area, if you will. And it was boundless. Put and Lubin were your helpers. We don't really know where Put was. Uh, but anyway, they were her, her helpers. Yet, she was carried away. All these things of grandeur for no Ammon, she still was uh, carried away, and she went into captivity. Her young children were dashed to pieces. You talk about uh, the uh, murder of babies. Uh, this was not uncommon back in this time. You know, life was very cheap, so it was not uncommon for them to uh, dash the young children. Just and that happened in the uh, United States or America. Indians would do that too to young children that they captured, and they was, they were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honorable men. And all our great men were bound in chains. So all the things that made her great were going to be gone. You also will be drunk. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean physically intoxicated. It may mean that the, uh, the invading force was so fierce that they were, they were wobbling around like they were drunk trying to get away. You will be hidden. They're going to try to hide from the invading army. You will also seek refuge from the, the enemy. But it's not going to do any good. All your strongholds, <clears throat> in verse 12, all your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they were, are shaken, they fall in the mouths of the eater. So the Ninevites going to be like uh, ripe figs on the tree. You know, it's a very desirable thing when, when they're ripe. 
and they would shake the trees and they'd fall down. I don't know if they had their mouth open so they could catch them, but they would still catch them and, and eat them. The Ninevites going to be like that. They're going to be the ripe fruit. They're going to be shaken, and they're going to be eaten by somebody else. Surely your women in your midst are, the people in your midst are women. Now, I don't want anybody to take offense to this, but that just means that they are, uh, people are now weak. Uh, you know, genetically, men are stronger than women. So when it's talking about uh, women, they're like women, it means they're weak. They're going to be weak. The gates in your, of your land are wide open for your enemies. You know, these uh, cities, of course, Nineveh had, uh, was, a, was a big city, had very strong uh, walls and what have you. But the gates can be wide open for the enemies, and fire shall devour the bars of the gates. They would, uh, when they closed the gates, they would put bars on them, whether they're made of metal or wood or what have you, but they're still bars, and those, things, those are going to be... Uh, burned up so they can't secure the gates anymore <clears throat> and here is given advice <clears throat> to the Ninevites verse 14 draw your water for the siege fortify your strongholds go into the city and, and uh, tread mortar the, the people are going to have to do some work make strong the brick kiln because some bricks were uh, fired and some were not but uh, it's going to take a lot of bricks to keep the enemy out. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. You know, he will eat you up like a, a locust. It's not going to do any good. It, uh, even though they uh, fortify the city and make it stronger, it's still not going to do any good. They're still going to be destroyed. <clears throat> and, and here you uh, he said to eat you like a locust, make yourselves many like the locust and make yourselves many like the swarming locust. And down in verse 16, locust plunders. Uh, there are different words that are actually used. If you got the uh, King James Version, it may use some places there, canker worm. Uh, these are the different stages of the locust. You, know, you may have the uh, larva stage, and I don't know whatever all the stages are of a, of a locust. But it's talking about the different uh, stages of a locust, and uh, these efforts is going to eat you up like the locust. But it's saying, make yourself like the locust. And when the locust matures, of course, it flies away. And you'd like to fly away, but you're not, you're not going to be able to do it. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. Uh, I think King James uses a different word there. I forgot what it was. But anyway, the locust, locust plunders and flies away. Uh, they would like to fly away, but they're not going to be able to do it. Your commanders are like swarming locusts, and your captains are like great grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, I know. Locusts, I don't know. But I think also the King James uses a different word for commanders and captains, but so there's some question about what they, they are, but the, the thing is that those who are le the leaders of Nineveh, um, they'd like to get away. And the captains, they'd like to hop away. Your captains like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. And if you think about a, a grasshopper that's... A, it's cold. It becomes cold. It's a. It's an. Insect. It's not warm-blooded. It's not a warm-blooded creature. So when it's cold, it's uh, torpid. It's not very active. And so it's saying here that uh, these grasshoppers are camped in these hedges on a cold day. They're inactive. But when the sun rises, they flee away. When the battle gets real hot, they're going to, they're going to flee away. Uh, and the place where they are is not known. They're, you know, they're going to just, wherever they go, it's going to be unknown. Your shepherds slumber. And this is really talking about death. 
the shepherds, the leaders that take care of the people, they're going to be dead. O king of Assyria, your nobles, again, those that are the elite of the uh, uh, the Ninevites, they rest in the dirt and the dust. They're going to be dead too. Your people are scattered on the, the mountains and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of, your, uh, of you will clap their hands over you. They're glad that it happened. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? Uh, the wickedness that they inflicted on others is going to be inflicted on them, and, and people are going to be rejoicing that it has actually happened. So that uh, concludes uh, Nahum. So the next book that we're going to consider is uh, Habakkuk. And uh, Habakkuk is a little unique in the, uh, some respect, is that it's not so much the prophet Habakkuk uh, preaching to the people. He's actually, uh, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it preaching, but he's appealing to uh, God. He's complaining to God about uh, the uh, things that are going on. And Habakkuk um, probably was written after Nineveh fell, uh, but before, and of course, Nineveh fell by the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, before they uh, actually destroyed the uh, city of Jerusalem, somewhere in there. Hard to know exactly, but um, there's some things that we uh, can note about the book. Again, I say Habakkuk is not really preaching to the people. He's taking the uh, complaint of the people uh, to God Himself, and uh, He's actually the lawyer or the representative of the people in uh, their complaint against God. But first of all, he, he does bemoan the uh, wickedness of Judah and uh, the fact that Judah was uh, had a great disregard for the law. And uh, Jehovah God acknowledges that and he points to the Chaldeans the uh, Babylonians as his instrument to uh, render judgment on on Judah. Now, uh, Habakkuk wonders, uh, why would you, God, use somebody more evil than Judah? You know, we might think of that in relative terms, that Judah was evil, but there were some faithful there. And uh, Babylonians were certainly more evil on any uh, uh, means of measuring evilness, if you, can, if you can do that. They were more evil than uh, Judah. So Habakkuk wonders, how can you use somebody more evil than Judah to punish Judah? He said it just didn't make any sense to him. Well, so Jehovah takes him through this. God uh, observes that you know when the unrighteous are punished, the righteous will suffer also. That's just going to happen. But the doom on the wicked is a certain thing. It's going to to happen. And he goes over uh, Israel's history, and he sees uh, God coming to assist his people at all times. You go back uh, over the, all the history up to this point in time, and you see that God has helped uh, the people. He has uh, uh, assisted the people through uh, very hard, arduous times. And he's always 
punish them when they uh, became unrighteous. And the reason he does this is not because he's just mean-spirited, God is mean-spirited. He does it always to save the people. And this is a lesson that Habakkuk uh, has to learn. And in fact, he does learn that. And we get down to the very great uh, uh, statement that the just shall live by faith. Now, we've seen in some of the other minor prophets where they are told to wait on uh, Jehovah, wait on God. You know, God is going to work his, his plan according to his own timetable, so wait on him. And that exhibits faith. So the just, the righteous, they're going to live by faith. They have enough trust and confidence in God that whatever may uh, come, they know that God is doing this for their good, even though they may uh, suffer because of the punishment of the unrighteous. They still have faith in God in God and in what He is doing, and, and it's for their uh, ultimate good. So this is a you know valuable lesson for us to learn about the things that are happening in this world today. I mean, the, the same processes are still going on. It's, it's always been the case. And we, and I've talked about the United States in particular, but it, it's, it's with regard to any country that the wicked are going to be punished. And we, as the righteous, may suffer right along with them. But the reason that the... Uh, wicked are punished is for their salvation and that the righteous must suffer along with them sometimes is for the salvation of the righteous. God is always, always interested in the salvation of people and he will do whatever is required to see that uh, they uh, live a righteous life even though that, that uh, it doesn't always happen. So the lessons that we can learn from Habakkuk is that the uh, uh, God will always punish the wicked. Even though he may use the wicked to punish other unrighteous people, even those uh, wicked people that he uses are going to be punished uh, ultimately. So he'll tolerate wickedness for a while, but uh, punishment is going to come so you know wickedness has its own reward and it's just going to happen but on the other hand where wickedness will have its uh, reward faithfulness is the uh, guarantee of uh, permanence not that you'll avoid uh, the faithful will avoid uh, suffering but there's a permanence in faithfulness that will ultimately uh, result in the salvation of the, per of the person. In evil, you know, one thing that we should uh, recognize, it's, it's a valuable lesson for us to learn, is that evilness is ultimately self-destructive. If the United States is, you know, you compare it with some of these nations before, and we're nowhere near that, but if the United States is an evil nation, it uh, is self-destructive. It will happen, or any other country that you, you can name. Uh, so we who are righteous need to be uh, patient. We will survive the uh, tyranny and arrogance of the uh, uh, evil people, of the unrighteous. So we just have to, again, live by faith and uh, things will ultimately work out in the uh, end. Another thing that we should uh, keep in mind is there is such a thing as divine discipline. You know, we, we sometimes may tend to ignore it, but there is 
divine discipline. How it comes about, we may not always be uh, certain how that's going to come about, or we can't predict it always. But anyway, it's a fact. Divine discipline is a fact. And Habakkuk here is just trying to solve the problem of uh, his countrymen being faithful uh, to God in spite of the suffering that they will ultimately suffer along with the unrighteous. So we'll get into the actual verses next week. So thank you for your kind attendance and attention. <laughs>